everyone and welcome to this final episode in our Education 4.0 series with our friends at JISC, looking at the changing world of education in the fourth industrial era. A big shout out to JISC for supporting the series, to all of our amazing guests and to you for listening in. What's been your favourite episode in the series? We'd love to hear from you. Tweet us using the hashtag edu4 underscore zero with what you've learnt or shared over the episodes we've put out to date. This week's episode is all about town and gown. How can town and gown work together to reinforce our social fabric? To kick off this episode, I spoke to Fiona Boyd at J. Whipple & Company, one of the largest gown makers for universities about the history of the term. First of all, what's the significance of the university gown? Okay, so we would refer to it as university robes. The origin of it it comes actually from the 11th century, when Oxford and Cambridge first became universities, and it was was used by the clergy when they were teaching Latin and to read the Bible. And they, they wore black coats, and it was to differentiate themselves from the college at Oxbridge, and that was done with a coloured hood. So that's where it first originated from, and then 300 years later, universities in Scotland, such as St Andrews, then followed suit and also introduced uh, the gown for academic dress with the coloured hood. And then it went from there and evolved in the 1830s. Okay, so evolving in the 1830s. And I'm guessing since the 1830s to the present day, has there been a lot of change or has it it kind of continued in that same tradition mostly? Uh, Yeah, it is very traditional dress. I mean, from... There, the coat, rather than it being a coat, was replaced with an open-sleeved gown. And then the hood became less functional and detached. So to differentiate the, um, the qualification, they would have different coloured hoods, yeah, um, yeah. which would distinguish the different qualification levels, and much like today. And you were just showing me this enormous tomb that you've got here with basically hundreds of pages of different styles of robe. And in there, so the point being that Ultimately, you can then differentiate which university you went to and what qualification you got. So it does also sort of tie you to the geography or yep. the, the accrediting body of the university as well. Yeah, yeah. So uh, like you say, you get different uh, style gowns depending on the, the university um, and they will vary. The, you have a, a Cambridge gown, a London gown, and then also the hood will differentiate the qualification. And again, you get different style hoods. Yeah, so it's a it's a big thick book. It's Shaw's academic dress, and most of us in the industry will refer to this with regard to checking the academic dress that they should be wearing, depending on their qualification and university. And I have to make a joke at this point, which is different hoods and different hoods. Different. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, what was the point about Oxbridge that was mentioned in relation to you know how much it the gown is. T- to a specific location or uh, okay so so the I, I know that you've we discussed the the town and the gown mm. um and it does only refer to to oxbridge so um in these cities the undergraduates had to wear gowns frequently during the day to attend lectures uh, okay so the sort of the town and gown tension might be more visible in oxbridge because People walking through the streets in their gowns yes. at, mo- at most times. And people could easily distinguish where they were from and, yeah. and, and what they were studying. Okay. So, yeah, the, the, the relevance of, of the term uh, tends to just refer to, to Oxbridge. As Fiona mentions, the history of the academic gown evolved from garments worn by clergy, which were practical for drafty buildings like churches and universities. In Roger Kemp's Town and Gown Relations, a handbook of best practices, this item of clothing also serves as a social symbol, as it was impractical for physical manual work. I certainly can't imagine doing the washing up or painting in one, for example. So, in their distinctive clothing, students were set apart and distinguished from the citizens of the town, and inevitably, this led to tensions. Do you have any personal experiences of, of town and gown and that sort of division between university and the rest of the local community? In most senses, 
in some, in some way, in some ways, it was quite good. But I had a couple of experiences that were actually really troubling. I mean, one time I was walking down a nice road in the middle of the boxes with my friend that we were arguing about football, I think. Um, when I argue, my accent gets stronger. So my Croydon accent was really coming out. And we had eight guys walking towards us in tuxedos and kind of ignored them. And then two of them from behind had grabbed my legs and pulled them up, like kind of hit into the into the concrete. And they started stamping on me and they were talking about stamping on a chair or something like that. Um, and my friend tried to stop them all, but there were, there were too many. And it was only somehow in the argument, they realized we were students and they all stopped. And even apologized when one of them was trying to trying to help me up. Um, and it was it was like as if uh, suddenly I was a little bit like them and was and was humanized. And it wasn't okay to to kick me in the head. And I think it's only rare experiences, but I think that for me really kind of made a, a, a stark impression about the division between you know, students in a in a town and the way of sometimes the, the people in the local community are treated. And so when I reflect on experiences like that. It really makes me think how it's damaging that division between town and gown can be. That's James Asfer, a former Oxford student now working in community engagement between citizens and universities. James had a Croydon accent different to most of his fellow students. At the start of universities in the UK, many university students were foreign and spoke Latin. Students often could not speak the local dialect and most uneducated townspeople spoke no Latin at all. Recurring themes of language barriers, unfair rental agreements, university campus rule, impunity from civil laws and rowdy student behaviour underpin the tension between town or local citizens and gown, i.e. the incoming students. Here's Christopher Day, university lecturer and fellow of Kellogg College, Oxford University, talking about one of the largest escalations of town and gown violence. The Battle of St Scholastica at Oxford, a protracted two-day battle in which local citizens armed with bows attacked the academic village, killing and maiming scores of scholars on the 10th of February 1355. This was before long uh, one of um, the sources of a great deal of problem in Oxford. Uh, all medieval towns were violent. Oxford was notorious even by the standards of the, the day. And one of the big problems is that you have nearly 2,000 young, high-spirited, energetic, more or less out-of-control young men wandering the streets, getting into mischief. And in the early days, the university had very little organization to deal with this. And in a way, the university's organization, its administration, grew up in response to the hostility that it met from the town. The town's view of the university, the town, of course, a great deal older than the university. The town's view of the university in Oxford is that all was well in Oxford till the university arrived, and it's been downhill ever since. So that's just another view of things uh, for you. Uh, Just to give you one quick example, the worst riot we know of in Oxford, 1355, uh, left 60 people dead. Uh, This was not scuffling in the streets. This was pitch battles. And uh, therefore, the university had to organize itself. And the next slide, which um, probably looks a bit daunting to you, this is the earliest document in the university archives. It's a document of 1214, and it is the settlement of a dispute. There's been a riot, and it's a settlement of a dispute. And the significance of it is that it refers to the first time uh, to a chancellor, to a vice chancellor, uh, to administrative officers. So the whole administrative paraphernalia of the university is created. It starts to be created here. And it is created as a direct result of these disputes with with people in in the town. So much of what the university has now in the way of its administration is set up round about this date. So it's 800 years old or so. And it hasn't changed that much, actually, as we keep reminding the university on many occasions. In this clip, Christopher reminds us that much of our university structure today has been forged through the combined needs and tensions of town and gown. Indeed, the University of Cambridge was also originally set up after a fight between the townspeople of Oxford and scholars from the University of Oxford forced many scholars to flee to a new location in 1209. But whilst tensions still exist, and it's easy to think of the dichotomies of the liberal university-educated elites versus the people put forward by populist media of today, 
It's interesting to think about what forms an evolving university in the 21st century might take, forged with local needs and wants. Our vision for education is a future where we have a broader education, a fairer education and a smarter education. So what does that mean? A broader education means that uh, we are preparing all learners to build skills, capabilities and knowledge that will be required, especially with the rise in automation and AI, uh, things like creativity, problem solving, collaboration, resilience, uh, social and emotional skills will be more important. And currently, our, our education system is not building that. So how can we support that? Um, we've launched uh, a Future Ready grant fund, uh, looking at some high potential early stage ideas to build those skills. Um, secondly, the current tech environment is not diverse and inclusive. So how can we support social mobility and diversity in tech careers, especially in the field of artificial intelligence? I spoke to Joycey John, Head of Education at Nesta, earlier on in the year about broadening out what education means and hyper-localising what's on offer. So we've built UK's first skills taxonomy, which is actually built using artificial intelligence. We looked at 41 million job adverts to look at what are the skills employers are demanding and how can we understand the different categories of jobs and the skills needed for it? And we've published a prototype skills map. We've published our research looking at what are the jobs that are going to see an increase in demand? What are the jobs that are going to see a decrease in demand? And all the talk in UK has been around, yes, let's get more digital skills. But we found that not all digital skills are equal. So you need to actually focus on the digital skills which are not easily automatable. So for example, if you're spending your effort just teaching people to do basic digital things, those will get automated. So how do you make sure you're building the right skills? So this tool that we have built and it is available on Nesta's website, this prototype can help people not just learners or policymakers, uh, businesses or educators, it will help them understand, A, what are the skills that we will be in high demand and B, what is the value of these, these different skills? So I highly recommend people understanding the changing labour market information That's using more accurate information. So do you have an idea of some of the ones that are more higher value digital skills? Uh, those that will require creativity, so things like animation, 3D, things that help you solve problems. So a lot of the things that will be in high demand will be the things that machines can't do. So yes, machines will be able to do a lot of the routine calculations, but when it comes to thinking creatively, coming up with new solutions, empathizing with another human or finding out what the key problem is, those are the things humans are great at. And we need to be focusing on those skills. And then how did you come into this role? What's your background? And what did you, you ask the audience today what, what they studied and if they stayed in it. So is I, that the same for you? Or Absolutely. I've had five different careers in the last uh, two decades. You've been so, busy. <laughs> so I started as a computer engineer because yeah, I wanted amazing. to solve problems. So I, I was very clear from a young age. And I, where did you study that? So I started learning programming at the age of 12 in India, okay. and then I did my undergrad computer engineering degree at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, and my first job was in a bank building pricing and risk management applications used by traders. So I have built technology, and I then moved on to business management and then into sales and trading. So I went back for a graduate degree in business administration at London Business School. And I worked as a, as a salesperson, as a banker. And then I realized that I had all the skills, but I wasn't... Oh, I didn't, wasn't singing. Yes. So I didn't have that meaning and purpose. And yeah. I wanted to do something to really change education because, you know, I came from a family where nobody had gone abroad or nobody had studied computer engineering before. Uh, and I was very fortunate to get these scholarships from this uh, Ministry of Education in Singapore. And I felt like if I could learn computing if I could learn maths from being a student who wasn't that good at maths and computing when it, to start off with, if I could do it, everyone else can. 
and how can we provide more young people, and especially girls and those from disadvantaged backgrounds, the opportunity to shape their future and the future of society. So that's how I left banking, became an entrepreneur. Um, before joining Nesta, I was part of the founding team at ADA, the new National College for Digital yeah, Skills. Yeah, I visited uh, there recently. It was great. Yeah, so I, I really believe that we need to build the right skills and capabilities and move the conversation beyond just acquiring knowledge because what's the point of acquiring knowledge if you can't apply it and can't solve real world problems so I'm very excited about my role at Nesta because uh, it spans research innovation programs and investments and we're looking at how we can use our convening power to influence policy and practice in UK. Joyce talked about diversity and role models and going back to the Croydon accent again, one of Croydon's most famous citizens is the hugely successful British rapper and singer Stormzy. Stormzy financed a scholarship programme for black students at Cambridge University, one of our most revered universities set in Britain's most unequal city. He talks about the backlash to the programme here. Amen and Jesus name, oh yes I claim it Any little bread that I make, I have to break it Brothers wanna break me down, I can't take it I done a scholarship for the kids, they said it's racist That's not anti-white, it's pro-black Hang me out to dry, I won't crack All these fancy ties and gold blacks Never had no silver spoons on our mouth, we sold Like, don't comment on my culture, you ain't qualified Stab us in the back and then apologise If you knew my story, you'll be horrified So, how do we create more opportunity and dialogue between town and gown? and make the university more porous, not less. More of us are going to university than ever before, but who decides who shouldn't enter? And how do we broaden the concept of gown? Who is within the university fold, and does this end with the students and scholars, or go far beyond? If interdisciplinarity is shaking up the university curriculum, can we take the same approach to who we bring into the education family? My biggest inspiration is my mother, who was a teacher in India, And she used to always tell me that the biggest gift that any parent can give their child is education. And And what's her name? Her name is Rosie. Rosie. Well, well done, Rosie. (laughs) Joycey was one of my favourite interviews this year because she was so open about the role of her mother in her own educational journey and opportunities. One organisation hoping to harness this energy is Parent Power. Uh, Well, I think for me it was was transformative. Um, I, I, mean, I grew up in, in Thornton Heath in, in in Croydon and ended up going to going to Oxford and so it was a, very much a case of different worlds and just the opportunities and, and confidence it gave me was was transformative. But one of the reasons why I got into community organising, but also one of the reasons why I'm being so passionate about parental engagement is when I when I got to Oxford, I met some you know, lovely people and had all sorts of opportunities that were available to me. But one of the fundamental things I saw was that a lot of people I met were no smarter or harder working or more determined than my friends from, from Croydon. But I just had completely different opportunities and expectations and networks. And that was what made, I think, made me really angry because I saw I just saw the, the sort of myth of a level playing field where the harder you work, the more you succeed was, was nonsense. And actually it was all sorts of baked in privilege into the, into the system that made me think, how do we try and change things? And this idea of trying to change things with people is why I was so interested in, in organising. And the second thing I, I realised is that there were there weren't many people there that had a, a similar you know, accent or, or background to me, which in some ways made it quite difficult. And I think that was reflecting on that made, really also made me think, motivates me to try and open up that sort of access to, to university and make sure that other people from like mine are able to go if they want to. Remember him? That's James Asper, lead organiser of Citizens UK and founder of the Parent Power Programme with King's College London. Pioneered by King's widening participation department and community organising charity Citizens UK, Parent Power has trained more than 200 parents in university access, student finance and tutoring. Here he talks about how Parent Power started. But the challenge I think that Kings has had is how do you, as a university, how do you reach out and build relationships with local parents? And they tried a few things that have been um, more or less successful. 
And we started to talk about, could we use the tools of community organizing, which is a, a methodology for, for change and bringing communities together and building campaigns, could we use those tools that had started the living wage and other campaigns, but for wider participation, particularly around the parental engagement? And so we spent a few months thinking about it and discussing it. So rather than the two of us sitting in a room and coming up with the perfect sort of parental engagement plan or program or um, set of activities, we started the other way around. Um, so rather than sort of doing a program, we decided to start with the people and the parents. And so the, the way that Parent Power started was very simple. King's had existing relationships with 13 local schools. And through those schools and existing relationships, we, we met with parents. And for the first few months, all we did is have uh, me and one, uh, one of the, the members of Amory's team sat down and had one-to-one conversations, roughly half an hour, with, with parents. Um, and so we'd go for, for coffee with parents, and rather than saying, you know, these are the things that King thinks is good for you to do, and this is what we think is important, we just sat down and listened and sought to build relationships. And so it was saying to the parents, what is it that's important to you? What are the barriers that your, you think your children are, are facing and potentially going to university? Why is education important to you? This is why it's important to, to us. And on the back of that, I think we had over 100 of these one-to-one conversations over three months. That was the, the formation of the first 50 parents that came to be the sort of founding members themselves of, of Parent Power and um, Met Kings. And everything that Parent Power did, the topics we taught parents about higher education, the campaigns we run, how we structured meetings, how often we met, all of that was sort of formed and uh, decided by the parents themselves. So in, in, all, in, all, in, all, in all instances, that's sort of their organization. And I think it was that sort of focus on relationships, the focus on putting the people before any program, and that sense of putting the parents in, in control of, of the organization, is that what led Parent Power to, to sort of grow and, and, and flourish and provides a sort of a level of engagement with the university and secondary school parents um, that I think is unprecedented. Well, that's amazing. And I was intrigued because you mentioned community organising. And if I understand correctly, you have an MA in community organising from um, Queen Mary University London. So I just wondered sort of how that helped to underpin the guiding principles of how parent power is run. Yeah, I think there's three kind of broad principles of, of community organizing that we, we put into place with parent power. I mean, the first one is just that importance of, of power, of people having the, sort of the agency and, and, and ability to change things in their, in their lives and local communities. And that was very much behind the name of parent power. It's not sort mm. of parent support. It's not parent engagement. So the primary principle is to, is to give people more power and, and, and say over the, their lives and communities. And so that was kind of the first principle that underpinned what we did. Uh, the, the second principle, which I mentioned before, is this idea of people before program, not sort of thinking that there are in a sense, experts going to tell people what to do, but actually listening to, listening to people, training them how to listen to others, and really forming everything we do through the relationships we have. And the third one is, is which is a crucial element of community organizing, is this idea of leadership development. And so the idea of not trying to do things for people, not giving people the means to step out of their comfort zone, uh, learn and, 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 and progress their, their leadership. And I think that's important because a lot of times I think people have this idea of leadership that is based on a kind of position or qualifications or particular role you have. Whereas actually, if we see leadership as something that's really rooted in relationships, you know, are you, are you able to lead people? It means it's accessible to, to anyone. And suddenly, you get parents who perhaps are feeling quite isolated in the secondary school without relationships with other parents in the mm. local community. Quite quickly, can really develop as leaders if they start as other parents start to lead to them. And so when we've started to do things like um, training parents about how UCAS works, they can then go and talk to other parents in the in the schools and communities and and sp- spread that kind of knowledge and understanding in a way that perhaps wouldn't have been av- available previously. And so everything we do is thinking, well, how do we build the power of parents? How do we actually ensure that we're putting 
people before anything you do, any program. And lastly, like how do we use this as a as a leadership development process so that it's not led by you know, anyone at King's, yeah, staff member, but it's led by the parents through parent power. In past episodes in this series, we've talked about the evolution of the university campus. Here, James talks about the faceless building of a university for those who don't feel involved. Our conversations with most of the parents has mainly been a a case that before parent power, it was it was not really a factor. So they they wouldn't they just walk past King's and it'd just be another building. And I think that's the the crucial change that's that's come through parent power and this idea of building relationship is that now King's as a civic institution is a really prominent part of those parents' lives. And they understand not just how it works, but there's there's a relationship with the people in the in the institution that makes it relevant to them. And so they know that actually if there's a particular challenge that's happening in their community, that they can go to they can go to Kings and if they want to contribute in some way, they can go. They can go through Kings, and I think that is the, the fundamental difference. Because I think it's very easy to be in a big city like London. Is there for there to be parallel worlds? You need to have a university where the students and the staff have almost no interaction with the local community, even though the community may be struggling with issues that you know, the academics are working on. But there's, there's no the relationships just aren't there. That's one of the most fundamental differences that, that I think we've got to parent power. And I think it's opened up a whole network of skills to build those relationships between the local community and between the, the university. Um, I didn't know much about King's. I only knew it was a university in central London. Um, and that's about it, really. I had never been to a university before. Um, and the fact that I was able to go there with my son and and do that, and I have other parents there, meet students. Um, it's just something that makes me, it reassures me as well that, oh, this is what I would like for my son. Um, so it makes you want it more. Liliana Torres is an active member of Parent Power. She talks about the impact it's had on her own life and that of her family. And you mentioned, you know, you didn't go to university. So when was the first time that you would have? stepped onto a university campus was would that have been King's College um yep I mean I when I when I was younger I I had my children quite young yeah so I thought that wasn't an opportunity for me one thing at, at the family day though that there was a a soul from a university called Dykebeck yeah and they sort of do uh degrees for mature learners and I decided to to find out what sort of degrees they did, and I actually started a, a degree myself. Yeah, which um, I've, I've, it's very challenging, but at the same time, it's really rewarding, and it's made me think. Yeah, you can you can do it if I can do it, and hopefully, I I think if my children see that I can do it, then they can do it. <laughs> That's fantastic. And what's what, what's the degree in? It's management and accounting. Yeah, and I'm halfway now. So I'm just about to start my third year and, and I'm really happy great. that I've done it. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Yeah. And just the change that I've seen in my children, my youngest, who's just starting secondary school as well, um, one of the comments he said was, my mum is really smart. So for them to to think like that and to think, oh, well, she, she can do it, so why can't I? So that's really important for me. That's incredible. So you, your son now, is he coming up to sort of university age? He's in year 10, so he's just started his GCSEs. Okay, yeah. Choosing his GCSEs, I felt like I had more of a informed choice to help him from all the university training that I've had and knowing that he can go on to do a Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor of Science and what, what subjects will help him to mm-hmm. lead to those degrees all that has come from parent power so I'm very I'm very feel I feel very privileged to have been a part of it it's helped me so much (laughs) so my background is Latin American Mm -hmm. and I noticed that I was the only Latin American parent there and I know that's not the case in Southern Columbus because most of the parents are from Southern Columbus so I just thought if I got more 
letting American parents involved um, will be make, make it more better for my community. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I'm I'm planning to run a Spanish Parent Power, and the event I'm I'm doing is um, just inviting different institutions, having Latin American students there that are at Key Stage Three, as well as some of the Latin American societies at King, and just coming together and see what we can bring and how we can help each other in the higher education. Yes. <laughs> So making it more of a support network as well, from your own perspective. Yeah, that's right. Um, for As a parent's perspective mm. and also as a student, because if you're a first-time student, a generation student, it can be quite daunting. And um, yeah. At least if you have parents supporting you and knowing the education system, the higher education system, they're able to... Yeah, just support you with the choices you can make. And you mentioned kind of at the beginning when you spoke to someone from sort of Parent Power and and the university around challenges. I think you said your sort of son was starting secondary school there. It was more of him just starting secondary school and he he had to get used to all the more independent learning. Right, yeah. For him, it was quite a tough period and just how my role can be supportive and what actions I can do. And you sort of lose touch with other parents because your children start going to school on their own. Right. So, And it's not like in primary school <laughs> where you go and you um, speak to other parents in the school gate if you have other con- any concerns. So you lose that touch. And But what I found with Parent Power is I've regained that. I can voice my concerns to other parents. And when you're in that room, you realise other parents have the same concerns as you. Yeah. So it it just helps. (laughs) It's quite interesting as well, because I guess to date we've spoken about how parent power is useful in relation to navigating the university system. But has it also got other benefits in terms of sort of just networking yourself with the sort of local community and sort of getting to know people and, you know, outside of, the actual university just actually kind of connecting with people on that other level as well uh yes well I've I've gotten to meet other parents from different schools so I get to look at different perspectives Mm -hmm. we've also gone on trips together so we've visited Oxbridge Mm -hmm. and other universities such as Leicester and Imperial and we get to um, learn how different universities work and just um, what they're doing for us, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the questions I asked at Imperial was, are you doing contextualised degrees for um, your students? Um, do you have support available? Mm-hmm. And I had very vague answers. So it's just the opportunity that I was there to do that was really empowering for me. So actually getting behind, you know, what, sometimes it's just like a, a massive UCAS book and actually getting to know the culture of the university as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, visiting in different universities, we, mm-hmm. you understand the sort of how different it can be and what opportunities there are. Um, Did you have fears before that experience about, you know, whether it would be the right thing? Definitely. I always, I always thought it was just something that's really hard to get into. Mm-hmm. But just workshops at King's and the sort of advice they give you of how you can support your child's learning in the home environment. And little things like they do something called Doc Stocks, where mm-hmm. in conjunction with the King's Scholar skills that they're learning. So things like self reflection, well, how well am I doing, comprehension, am I understanding the task? So just being able to support him in a more practical way, just really helped. So, whilst Education 4.0 has expanded access to the university experience in terms of numbers, both within a physical and online campus, student wellbeing is also demanding better communication and personalisation of needs depending on each of our circumstances. A parent power in different areas of the country. Mm-hmm. So, I know that one of my our parent power leaders, Jennifer, she 
spoke uh, in Manchester, Old Ham, about establishing a parent power there and also doing a Spanish parent power to get more Latin Latin X community involved and because sometimes things like a language can be a barrier. Yeah. So that would be awesome for me. And so if people are listening in, either as parents or as other university representatives, and they're interested in kind of replicating this model, who should they contact? How should they uh, think about developing that? Well, we'll be happy to do a focus group to get things started. Also opened a Parent Power page on, on Twitter. Oh, cool. Um, it's Parent, Parent Power SL, so it's South London. Um, because we want a parent power in every area mm-hmm. and we want universities to work with us. We're very eager to hear from them. And if you had something that you could wish for from you know, universities, if they could change slightly their ways, is there any kind of, how would you like to see universities work with local communities? Something similar like the King Scholars Programme mm-hmm. where children are, go to the university so it becomes a familiar environment to them they it teaches them those core skills that you need at university those study skills and involving parents and uh, listening to parents needs and as well as having contextualized degrees just taking into account where the applications where the child has studied if it's a a school where it doesn't have good report if they can look at what in terms of what the actual grades are for the school and then looking at the child if their grades are above so they can they can see that that child has thrived in that environment a difficult mm-hmm. a difficult already environment to look at things like that at that rather than just a stars across the board absolutely yeah so yeah trying to see see the kind of um yeah just look more individual needs rather than just grades Fantastic. Well, that's so interesting. And um, yeah, I wish you all the best with the rest of your studies as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is as much about old fashioned face to face relationship building as it is about technology. There's an important role for technology potentially in, in reaching out or connecting parents, but only as a supplement to the face to face relationships. So the Everything we've we've done at Parent Power, the reason why we've been able to bring together such a diverse array of parents from different backgrounds, uh, parents who wouldn't do anything like this usually, is through the trust and relationship built through these face-to-face meetings. And I think without that, the whole thing would have collapsed. We would have got two parents who'd be the usual suspects that would have come, and that would have been the end of it. And in every single meeting, we start with uh, the Parent Power meetings with a round, we ask a question about something, something like, why is education important to you or someone who's inspired you in, to make change in your life, something like that, where so the first or maybe half an hour of every two-hour meeting is, is focused just on sharing and answering a question like that, which is about building trust and relationship in the team so that, if, so that then people are able to work together effectively and relate to and trust each other. Because we don't want it to become the kind of committee where people can be on it for years and not even know each other's names and, and, and motivations. When things get difficult, if there are challenging things we have to discuss and decide, it's that depth of relationship that makes it makes it possible. And that, I think, is irreplaceable. But once you've got that sense of relationship, then I think technology can be, can be useful in connecting those parents to other parents, potentially new parents, for example, coming in, or for coordinating among the existing parents. I think that's the role technology can play. But it can't, in a sense, it can supplement, but it can't replace this that face-to-face element of it. And even though new university models are popping up, the need for rootedness in the local context and in traditions is still clear. As you said, it is very traditional. We haven't altered the gowns and, and the universities haven't altered the gowns in terms of the styles. Several years ago, when a lot of the universities went from polytechnics to universities, those polytechnics, when they became universities, introduced the academic dress and they had robes designed for them at that point. But using the traditional style 
shapes of hoods and gowns. So in terms of the actual innovation side, yes, there is the consideration of how innovation can, can help the student. I mean, you could consider how augmented reality might become part of future graduations, um, in which case then the gown becomes irrelevant. But if we're going to stick to traditional dress, which they have now for, you know, hundreds of years, uh, will it alter? You know, it hasn't altered so far. <laughs> it's maybe just how it's delivered to that end user. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting question and a question we get asked a lot and, and innovation is going to form part of that and we have to have a look at how, how it will form part of it. But it would be a shame to lose a tradition such as the academic dress at graduation. So. And that's it from this Education 4.0 series. It's been a real pleasure to have you with us. And some of my favourite episodes have been the one on Only Connect, which looked at hybrid campuses and partnerships. And I also love my interview with the passionate team at the University of Northampton. And I hope you've got your favourite episodes too. If you're having episode withdrawal symptoms, do go and find out about our new series on the EdTech podcast, which kicks off this month. And you can also continue the conversation online at hashtag edu4 underscore zero at JISC and at podcast edtech on all the social medias. And if you've got a gown, you should give it a swish. And if you're from a town, you should voice the accent loud and proud. Thanks also to my guests and you for listening. For all the show notes, it's www.theedtechpodcast.com. Have a great week. Bye-bye. <laughs>